Thank you, Catherine. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I am really pleased to welcome all, you all here to the first in-person event of the revival of the Dallas Literary Festival presented by SMU. Yeah. And before I say anything else, I want to acknowledge, thank, and congratulate Dr. Sandria Smith, who's right here, for being the principal organizer of the festival. <laughs> Dr. Smith and her team have done extraordinary work. You've all seen the program and you see how extraordinary and fantastic it is. Um, look at the lights downtown tonight and you'll see something else extraordinary there. Um, so we're all really thrilled for the kind of work that's been happening, it's made this festival possible. I also want to point out if you have not read Mourner's Bench, which is Dr. Smith's novel, pick it up, do yourself a favor. It is an engrossing, mesmerizing novel. I mean, you. You'll, you'll get into it and you'll be like, I don't want to go to work, I don't want to go to sleep, I have to finish this novel, so do yourself a favor. <clears throat> um, what is literature? Um, I've been thinking about this for a long time. I happen to be, my PhD is in literature. Um, when I'm not being a dean, I am a scholar of 17th and 18th century European prose fiction. One of the things that intrigues me is how did the prose fiction form start and what kinds of forces, social, historical, economic, political, what kinds of forces shaped it um, across, across time and across space. Um, then I want to think about what is literature in the, in, the, in the sense of its form. And the simplest definition I can come up with is it is the aestheticized use of language, pure and simple. Okay, so what, what the aestheticized use of language does is call attention to itself as form. And what that means is, to a greater or lesser extent, it's gonna put the emphasis on the form rather than the ostensible content or message that it is communicating. Okay, so that's what, what I think literature is. More importantly for me is what does it do? So if you're, if you're processing or consuming the aestheticized use of language, you're also in at that same time processing some kind of message. And I wanna put the aestheticized use of language over and against standard discursive speech. And the way I like to think about that is if you're trying to convince someone in an argument that you are right, you want, to, you want to direct their attention to your particular interpretation and nothing but that interpretation. Okay, that's kind of logistic, uh, standardized speech. The aestheticized use of language doesn't care so much about the convincing thing. What it wants to do is teach you something in a way that regular discursive speech might not be able to do. And if you think about your favorite works you've ever read, and all of us read differently, if you think about your favorite works you've ever read, you probably learn something in a way that you're not quite able to articulate. Think of some of the greatest works you've ever read. And they could be the classics or just something that for you carried an especially powerful message. Often what that work will do is articulate something in an inarticulate way. That is, the aesthetic can produce resonances, connotations, and feelings in, the, in you that teach you about something you're not able to articulate in regular discursive speech. That is the power of literature, and that's why so many powerful emotions, feelings, movements have come out of the aestheticized use of language. And as I look at the program tonight and for the rest of the festival, I see so many possibilities there, and I'm really excited to see this carrying on. So thank you all for being here, and right now I'm very pleased to introduce to you Ra Kazadi, who is the gifted artist who produced this image. Ra, take it away. I've always been a little bit more visual than I have been discursive, so you have to hold on to this. But uh, I'm Rock Azadi. I'm a senior at SMU, Dallas-based artist. I play football here at SMU, too. But uh, I was really excited about this project. When I heard about it, Professor Smith contacted me, and she's like, I want to talk about resilience. I want to talk about like what reading can do, what literature can do for people. And this really connected with me because I run a nonprofit that supplies I run a nonprofit that supplies school supplies and food and things like that to people experiencing homelessness. And like, I just felt like this connected because for me, this painting is my little sister and she embodies resilience. She's been through a lot and reading got her through that. And I think that there's a big connection between reading and art and the 
visualizing like escape, like where can you go? Where can you go with reading? Where can you go with art? And I think that a festival like this really shows you what you can do, especially with, <laughs> are you, no? Especially with Dr. Smith putting the lights on the Dallas skyline. She looked at me like I was messing up. But yeah, especially with Dr. Smith putting the lights on the Dallas skyline, this shows you how big this is and just how much it is. So yeah, you can bid on this piece of art at raw.betterworld.org. And yeah, it's, I'm just really excited about this process. I don't really want to date Dr. Smith, Professor DiBiero, everybody here for being here. So thank you. Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Joshua Arce. I'm going to do a couple of quick introductions. I'll be a moderator for tonight. So uh, as we get in later into the evening and we do get the Q&A session, if you'll allow me an opportunity to come over with a microphone or repeat the, micro uh, repeat the question, uh, that way it's being recorded. We are able to hear all of those questions that come through for everyone. So I'd like to greet you all. I'd say kwatse. I'd say yate. I'd say washte. I'd say osio. Bojo and Iguien, Chigiga Be, Nishna Be, Disnoswin, Joshua Arce, Desnokas, Chequax, Damiwe, Skodani, Bodwadmi, Minadao, Chewan, Mowin, W. Don, Bodwadmi, Mine, Gigabo, Nok Gigwan, Koshnan, De Gwa, Guan, Moat, Noski, Kokom. Greetings and thank you. Chigiga uh, Be is my Indian name, it means bad thunder, and I'm Thunder Clan. Joshua Arce is what I'm called. I'm Potawatomi. I bring happiness from where the Potawatomi and Kickapoo people are. I thank our Father God for this day. I would also like to start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, we respectfully acknowledge all Native American peoples who have lived on this land since time immemorial. I especially acknowledge and pay respect to the Caddo Nation who view this land as ancestral and unceded traditional territories the Wichita and affiliated tribes, which are the Delaware, Choctaw, and Cherokee nations that occupied this area, in addition to the Apache, Comanche, Kiowa, Os and Osage nations that recognize this area as hunting ground, a trade exchange point, and a migration route. We acknowledge the many benefits, responsibilities, and relationships of being in this place, and we use this as a point of reflection, a commitment towards historical recognition, a pledge of diversity, inclusion, culture, and equity to our community. So I have the privilege and distinction of being able to uh, introduce Dr. Damaris Hill. Uh, Dr. Hill is the author of A Breath Better Spent, Living Black Girlhood from 2022, A Bound Woman is a Dangerous Thing, The Incarceration of African American Women from Harriet Tubman to Sandra Bland, 2019, and that was a 2020 NAACP Image Award finalist for Outstanding Literary Work, The Fluid Boundaries of Suffrage and Jim Crow, Staking Claims in the American Heartland, 2016, Visible Textures, 2015. Hill has a keen interest in work of Toni Morrison and theories regarding rememory as a philosophy and aesthetic practice. Therefore, Hill uses digital material and critical fabulation research methods to write about America and geographic places. Similar to her creative process, Hill's scholarly research is interdisciplinary. Hill is, a, uh, his, Hill is an associate professor of creative, creative writing at the University of Kentucky. Dr. Hill. Um, I want to first uh, thank you for that great introduction, Joshua. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, the land and the people that were here before um, America was curated and created. Um, I also want to honor the people that are here with us in spirit rather than in physical form. I want to thank you for SMU for hosting and thank you for the invitation, Dr. Smith. I'm going to read, I went back and forth a bunch of times, but I'm going to read a short piece from my latest book, Breath Better Spent, 
If you know a little girl, she would love it. This book sparkles and catches light, if only for that. Um, but this is a book about black girlhood and the resilience of black girlhood. Um, so yeah, that's where we'll begin and how black girlhood is not bound by age. You can be 82 years old and still have your girl with you. And that's me. All right, I'm gonna open with this poem, still scary. Afraid of bugs, babies, pop balloons, sticky peppermints, cracks that'll break your mother's back, words that sound like windows breaking. Your heart is too fragile. Fright over voices that are pretty enough to ride the rafter, rafters, lyrics that climb on ladders, afraid that a piano chord is a stairway. You scared of spiders and old saints frying chicken in church basements, smacking on bacon with crackling rinds in the pews. You timid about every boy you adored and never told. You hiding from happy. You terrified of joy. The two of them got heartbreak on the horizons. Infatuation is an infection like bed bugs, affliction, excuse me, like bed bugs, creeping in like seventh grade 35 years later. You squinting and giddy, you drooling at the luster of past lives in his shaved head. You ain't never had good sense. You ain't never know the difference between curiosity and chaos. He got you cheesing. Each of his cavities carries a cavern of stories you want to know. You tell him to gift wrap his wounds, serve them to you on a broken plate. This is a trap, an illusion, a way to convince him you are brave. Watch him, watch you, gulp all his demons and everything that scares him. You are a woman and have done it all before. When you are eight, you follow a pack of boys into the woods to find a vine. These boys are swinging Tarzans, banging their caged hearts, tempting violent deaths. You celebrate each boy's victory. Faithfully, you forget your ride across the wild, your eyes closed, your heart open and abandoned. You didn't fall or break your arm. You didn't take a second turn. You refused to ride in the back of wagons. Every page carries wood, paper cuts, and toe prints, marking the spot you gripped before you jumped. So um, this poem is entitled Beloved Weirdo, and I would like to dedicate this poem to Toni Morrison and um, Harriet Jacobs. Beloved Weirdo, you are not digging this book about a slave girl and her incidents. The pages read about her early knowing of all things. Meanwhile, you ain't got a stitch of sense. If you did, you would have put that book down and hit that boy asking you if your name is Setha and if you are, I'm sorry, if your name is Beloved and if you are gonna be like Setha and kill the newborn baby he wants to put in you. Is he the weirdo watching in on you and your bestie leaving the woman's clinic? You wish you would have gone wild as the wind on him for prying. Instead, you go deaf and dumb thinking on it. Your mind wanders into a book. You think on asking, Miss Harriet Jacobs, how does a girl learn to be a slave? Does a snake bite you and leak venom until you fall crippled and spasm, zombie you into a slave? If no, then you gotta swallow a butterfly and let it flutter in your throat. Smother your words until you become a slave. Do you let the butterfly kick you way up into your tonsils? This might make your eyes rummage the floor for cracks and force you to be humble. Can a slave be made from a butterfly that avoids the windows, avoids the light? Does the butterfly become a bat under the girl's collar? Or do you crawl under the hoof of a horse named Andrew Jackson to become a slave? The horse galloping and neighing at your earlobes, dirt in with the blood. To be a slave, which you had to take your ribs and fashion Andrew Jackson's hooves with ivory shoes. Would the overseers use your teeth to tether and hold Andrew Jackson's shoes in like nails? Do you offer the nag a pedestal and curtsy at the mayor's master? Just curious, not dying to know. Okay. Now I'm gonna look at my friend. What's my time looking like? Oh, this is great, okay. 
Um, this is a poem entitled, entitled Hotter Than July. You sit on two clouds of bees, honey storms in place of your hips. Your waist is an unripe watermelon, a tense and tight drum. You carry daisies for breast and with dandelion eyes. Summer is skipping away. Every radio humming static. Electric is July, hotter than we remember, which is why you pray for her return. Carrying sweet onions in the hot grease of your armpits, salt and soda crackers in the creases of your neck. July is a 7-Eleven of your childhood, fluorescent. Your jelly sandals are neon, your panties washboard and starch white, snapping hand game rhythms with your belly button. The driveway is your playground, littered with Christie dolls and cordless curlers. In the attic, you play with your vanity. You pretend it is a crib. You skip circles around a stool, sit on top of it, blue magic hair goo on the back of wrists. You pick at a face mirror. You blow on it to reveal the musings of your mustache. You karate kick an ankle into the air. Flash freeze there. You tiptoe balance between chip toenail polish and your need for October. Middle school is a distant dinner guest. It is July and you are still a girl. You wrestle back the pink folds of your body, cuss God for holding the woman in you for ransom. You beg for the blood. You want it rushing, shiny, thick and lush like your hair, enough to uppercut yourself in the tum, blood enough to inspire envy. You want it lava hot and licorice sweet. You want the boys to tell you that you smell like rusting quarters. Rumor has it that a girl's first blood is chocolate. You want it enough to chew Big Red while chomping on Cocoa Puffs and Pop Rocks. You want blood enough to make friends with the witches among the ordinary women. You run relays to the store for these huzzies. They drink ice cold Pepsi without staining their laundry always hanging their rusty drawers, dashed between the sheets. Okay, um, I probably have about seven minutes, or do I have eight minutes? Seven exactly. Seven exactly, okay. I have this thing with time. Um, this book was also inspired by um, an exhibit at the Colored Girls Museum in Philadelphia. And um, that exhibit was entitled In Search for the Colored Girl. And what that exhibit is about is about the attention that we do not bring to all the missing brown and black girls in the United States that um, are often never found. And so the end of this book is dedicated to those um, girls. And I want to start with a poem that might be familiar in narrative to us. All of Birmingham's baby girls. Our friend is named Angela Davis, and you are skipping rope. Together you roll call poets and philosophy, cookie recipes in the rhythm of double dutch ropes and heartbeats. You keep lists. The pens that hold nuclear power, pencil leads that are fashioned from Amazonian ores, the stuff Wonder Woman wears at her wrist. You will age bulletproof. Ask Oprah. <laughs> you do not have golden lassos the day Birmingham is blinded by America's truth. No, terrorists. America put 15 sticks of dynamite in the church steps, making four saintly girls seraphs. The organ sweats grief. The organ moans. The organ knows the gospel of tiny geniuses. The organ remembers when you tickled her ivory spine with a sinner's song. Tutti frutti, loose booty. The organ felt a, the spark you had for little Richard in your fingertips. The organ is a prophet. You are practicing for American bandstand. Your mama taught you to play the piano with sweetness. She keeps plenty company come Sunday afternoon. She tastes soot 
in her cake batter and knows that no one plans to show. Your mama howls over dead daughters and you snuggle into the bench, pinch the keys as pretty as Florentine Price to make your mama stop sobbing over the seared ribbon in the yard and the bombs on the bottom of churches. So, um, Mia, so I intended to write one poem about the girls from Borno and the Bring Back Our Girls hashtag and movement. And then my little mind got to wondering. Things that aren't said in my bio is that um, one, my mother is an immigrant. She's from the island of Bermuda. Two, that I served in the US military. I'm at least a third generation veteran. Um, and four, I can't think of girls being taken by soldiers and that thought drift into the air and not haunt me. So these are a number of poems in a series. And in this particular series, I talk about um, two sets of women that were taken during times of war. This poem is entitled, Bring Back Our Girls, Premonition Four. The 2015 man is the mirror of the 1944 man they resemble. Maybe the 2015 man is the great nephew of the imperial commander. A Japanese man says only 20,000 women slush beneath cold men in order to love. Imperial soldiers in wheelchairs pick at their scars, reciting the nicknames of ghosts, recalling the men they murdered. One soldier sobs. Proof screams in ink, and five witnesses turn into 410,000 women. Together, you become a wave of warm bodies beneath a tsunami of imperial uniforms. Memory fires, a grenade lands, dams break. You cry so loud your sisters are sure you are bleeding beneath a man wanting to love you, but left love in the battle. The world is at war with itself. Many are made to be comfort women, calls over their faces a gauze. You are the women waiting in the wastelands, like vast oceans deep in generations in Korea, in China, in Philippines, in Burma, in Thailand, in Taiwan, in Malaysia, in Vietnam, in New Orleans, in Port-au-Prince, in Rio de Janeiro, in Havana, in Miami, in Atlanta, in Locos, in Luanda, in Porto Novo, in Uganda, in Praia, in Las Vegas, in Los Angeles, in Brazzaville, in Akura, in Guinea-Bissau, in Morovia, in Malaya, in Dakar, in Freetown, in Juba, in New York, in Rome, in the District of Columbia, in Paris, in Berlin, in the cobblestone trenches of London, in every middle meter of the Vatican, needless to say Florence, in Cairo, in Le Lexington, Kentucky, even in the shipping crates in the port of Baltimore, and at the piers of Hong Kong, in the Holocaust, the one in Germany, and the one of the Atlantic skirting the Americas. Diplomats want to comfort you, lost souls. We'll tell you about girls, brilliant as suns. Their minds cast rays from their eyes and ears. Their pencils are emblazoned in a physics lab at an exam that will make them fit to fill wounds. Medical school will make each a doctor who erases AIDS from the breast of mothers and the mounds of flesh that form a lover. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Um, truly appreciate that. Thank you for all of those uh, pieces that you shared with us. Um, <clears throat> getting excited for the conversation piece, so. <laughs> but first, let me introduce uh, David. Um, David is a best-selling author. Uh, he is Ojibwe Indian from Leech Lake, 
the Leech Lake Reservation in northern Minnesota. He is the recipient of a Pushcart Prize, two Minnesota Book Awards and Fellowships from the NEH, Bush Foundation, and the Guggenheim Foundation. His book, The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, was a 2019 finalist for both the National Book Award and Carnegie Medal. He divides his time between his home on the Leech Lake Reservation and Los Angeles, where he is a professor of English at USC. The son of Robert Trier, an Austrian Jew and Holocaust survivor, and Margaret Seely Trier, a tribal court judge, David Trier grew up on the Leech Lake Reservation. After graduating from high school, he attended Princeton University, where he wrote two senior theses, one in anthropology and one in creative writing, and where he worked <clears throat> and where he worked with Toni Morrison, Paul Mundoon, and Joanna Scott. Trier graduated in 1992 and published his first novel, Little, in 1995. He received his PhD in anthropology and published his second novel, The Hiawatha, in 1999. His third novel, The Translation of Dr. Apel's A Book of Criticism, Native American Fiction, A User's Manual, appeared in 2006. The translation of Dr. Apel's was named a Best Book of the Year by the Washington Post, Time Out, and City Pages. He published his first major work of nonfiction, Res Life, in 2012. His next novel, Prudence, was published by Riverhead Books in 2015. His essays and stories have appeared in Granta, Harper's, Esquire, Tri-Quarterly, The Washington Post, Lucky Peach, The New York Times, The LA Times, Orion, and Slate.com. Ladies and gentlemen, David Schreier. Thank you, Josh. You make me sound awfully busy. <laughs> yeah, you were. You know? Thanks for coming. Honestly, in this day and age when you can have any story ported to you in whatever room you inhabit to sort of get yourselves out of those rooms and come to a place and to hear people is uh, it's pretty great. So it's really, and it's really appreciated. I should say my very first public reading was for my first novel in 1995. I was pretty excited. You know, I'm like, this is it. This is, it's all gonna happen now. You know, I have arrived. And so I showed up at the reading and my mom came out from Minnesota to Michigan where I was to, to come to my very first reading with me. And my roommate came with me. You know, I had support, I had my people, felt great. Show up at the, at the uh, Borders bookstore in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. And a uh, big stack of my book, about as tall as me, so six foot. You're not supposed to laugh. That's true. They're not supposed to. <laughs> not supposed to laugh. And uh, no, I, seriously, like. And uh, so we're getting ready to read, or I'm getting ready to read, and um, no one showed up yet except for my mom <laughs> and my uh, my roommate. There was literally nobody there. And then finally, some dude staggers by. And he was staggering, because <laughs> he was wasted. And uh, he's like, he's looking at the stack of books, right? He's like, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> and the, the manager of the bookstore said, oh, you know, we're having a reading. This is David Troyer. He's a first-time novelist. We've got his, his beautiful novel, you know, Little, and he's going to be reading from it very shortly. And this guy is like, my old lady's not going to pick me up for like another half hour, so <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then he passes out in the front row. Like, he's, he's like, he took up like four chairs, just sleeping it off. And so... I was a little disappointed, but uh, it's only gotten better, you know? And so, you know, thank you for showing up. Thank you. Thank you for not being drunk. Um, but if you are, that's, that it's, it's no problem. Like, it's, there's plenty of open seats. You can, you can relax. 
you know, he can kick back. Um, so yeah, but seriously, thank you for having me. Um, it's, it's always, I'm not gonna read to you. Um, I figure, I'm assuming you can read on your own. And so if you wanna, if you wanna read, you can read my stuff. Um, although maybe that's, no, no, I'm not gonna tell that joke. I'm not gonna tell, I'm not gonna tell that joke. Should I tell that joke? Okay, but considering, considering that this zip code overwhelmingly voted for Trump, right, and was one of the sort of most generous donors to Trump, maybe that's not a fair or safe assumption. And you tell me. Was that impolite? Oh, I'm sorry. Not sorry at all. I, sorry. No, I'm going to say something serious, though, soon. But I want to talk, actually, I want to talk with you. It's more fun to have a conversation than it is to simply recite uh, things that I may or may not have written and may or may not remember having written. So um, I'd like to talk to you about how I got into writing nonfiction at all. Because for me, for most of my life and most of my career as a writer, for me, the game was always fiction. You know, someone asked John F. Kennedy at one point why he wanted to be president, RIP, you know? And he said, I know, it's the, the Dallas jokes, you have to have the Dallas jokes. <laughs> and he said that he wanted to be president because that's where the power was. And so I felt similarly about writing novels. I, I wanted to write novels because I felt narrowly and sort of misguidedly that I wanted to write novels because I felt that that's where the power was. I had no interest in writing nonfiction. I had no interest in writing short stories. Novels, that's it. It's a great job. It's really a great job. You can sit in your room by yourself and you can make shit up. That's the job, <laughs> you know? It's the best job ever. Um, and I was content with that work. I was very happy doing that work and writing my little books. Um, but some stuff happened, actually, very close to home that hit really hard and that, that sort of moved me from that path onto a different one. And what happened was, in 2005, there was a school shooting at Red Lake Reservation in northern Minnesota. Red Lake is a sister reservation to Leech Lake. It's just up the road from, from where I grew up, from my community. And we're related through blood, community ties. It's very close. And in 2005, Jeffrey Weiss, this kid from Red Lake, for reasons that are not clear, killed his grandfather, who was a tribal cop, with his own weapon, took his weapons, his bulletproof vest, put it on, took a squad car, drove it to his high school, and opened fire on, his, on the staff, teachers, and his classmates at that high school. When he was done, nine people were dead, which at the time was the second worst school shooting in US history. It's certainly not the second worst any longer, right? But we have very strong connections to Red Lake. My father um, had worked in that school, and he actually helped write the bonding bills that got the school funded. My mom had worked in and for that school district, and I had very briefly worked in that high school too. And so we were, we were deeply connected and deeply affected by this by this loss. And so I was actually in New York staying with a friend and my brother Anton calls me and he says, where are you, who are you with? I've got some bad news. Because we're that kind of family, right? If you call, you know it's not good, right? <laughs> you know, that's how that goes. And so he told me, he said, there's been a shooting at Red Lake, we don't know much yet. And so I was disturbed, stunned, scared. And I turned on the news, trying to find out what happened. And I kept flipping from station to station. And then I couldn't, I was getting upset the more I channel surfed. And so I went online. And I'm going from site to site. And I'm getting more and more upset. And I'm, I'm, I'm so upset that I'm like yelling at the television. And I'm cursing. And I'm, I'm really worked up. And my friends, He's like, what's, what's going on? He's like, I know, okay, I know that the shooting's upset, but why are you yelling at my television? Why are you yelling at the TV? Like, what's, 
What's going on? And I said, because they're not reporting the news. That's what's up. And because on every station and on every site that I visited, it was the same, pretty much the same headline. On a poor remote reservation, tragedy strikes. And there's a little ghost word after the strikes. Because implied in that was, again. You know, and I was really upset by that. I said, you know, and I, I didn't have... I wasn't articulate in my grief or in my rage or in my disappointment at that moment. But in the days that followed, I was, I was talking to a book editor about a book of mine I was trying to sell him. And I was telling him about the shooting, about how upset I was, about how, how upset I was about, by the coverage. And I'm like, you know, by contrast, Columbine, when Columbine happened, which was only six years before that, in 1999, the headlines did not say on a largely Anglo, fairly affluent exurb. Headlines didn't say that. They didn't feel compelled to bring up race or class or even geography except to tell us that Columbine High School was in Jefferson County, Colorado. That's it. But when reporting about the reservation on a poor remote reservation, I said that's not reporting. That's not information. That's just lazy storytelling. That's what that is. And so I said to this guy, this book editor, I said, you know, this publisher, I said, you know, reservations aren't just a sum of all of the injustices that we've somehow endured, right? They aren't just reservoirs of pain. We care about these places. And we don't, and it, it seems crazy to have to say this out loud, but we don't care about them because they're horrible, because they suck. We care about them because these are vital, interesting, complicated places that matter deeply to us, that we're connected with, you know? And this guy, like, you know, I was venting, right, to this guy that I was trying to impress. Not a good move. Not a good career move, right? And he said, well, I've always wanted to publish a book about reservations and what they mean and why they exist and where they're going and what Native American writers write nonfiction. And I said, Sadly, only me. I hadn't written any nonfiction. <laughs> so, you know, when I talk to children, I say, this is the best thing you can do when you want a career is you lie your way into that career. That's what you do. <laughs> you lie. You know, I'm like, sadly, only me. And he said, well, maybe you should write this book for us. I said, well, if I'm called to the work, I'm called to the work. <laughs> if I must, I must. You know? But I had a really... Big prop. So I started, so I, we did it, right? I'm going to write this book for him. And he's going to publish it for me. And I suddenly discovered that writing nonfiction is very hard. <laughs> this is how dumb I was, really. I was really naive. I thought, hey, nonfiction, you just go out there, you talk to people, you figure out what happened, you write down what happened, you're done. I really did think that. Truly. Truly thought that. So I did that. I went out there and I talked to some people and I wrote down what I thought happened and then I thought I was done and I handed it into my publisher and then they sat with it for about nine months, which is long enough to make a human baby but much too long to sit with someone's manuscript, you know? And then after nine months, he's like, yeah, you know, we all read it in house, all of us read it. I'm like, great, teamwork makes the dream work. He goes, yeah, and uh, we all agreed. I'm like, consensus is something I love. Because yeah, we all agree that you need to start over. <laughs> I said, you mean reduce one part, amplify this other part? He said, if you were listening closely, you would have noticed I did not say that. <laughs> what I'm saying, and since I need to be clear, is if you hand us this book again, we will not publish it, we will cancel your contract, and you can pay us the advance back, which had been spent like years before that. Because right. years had passed. So it's not enough to know, so what I discovered is that it's not enough to know what kind of story you don't want to tell, but it's really hard if you want to change the narrative in some other way. It's not enough to know what you don't want to say. You have to know what you want to say and how you want to say it. And I didn't know. All I knew is that I did not want to tell the same old sad story about reservations that everyone thinks is true, but which isn't true. But I had no alternative. And part of the problem is the story of the Indian, right? Broadly put, is a tragic telling. 
a descending line. Native people in the American imagination are, a great, are people with a great future behind us. You know, once they were great, now they're no more. America and the story that America tells itself about itself has an Indian past and an American present, you know? So we, we suffer from what my colleague Viet Nguyen calls, um, what, what was the phrase he used? It was really elegant. It's like, um, something like narrative um, poverty. In his case, he's talking about Asian American narratives. He says, there's lots of stories about Asian people and there are a lot of Asian people telling stories in film and TV and books, but we don't have a lot of different kinds of narratives about Asian people, right? Sort of a narrative deficit. And Native people suffer from that same deficit, but I think it's even more dire. There are very few kinds of stories about us. Really, there's only one kind of story about us, and that story is we have lost. And not just that, we have disappeared. That's the story. That's the story we're encouraged to believe because our social utility in this country as Native people is to be gone. That's our job. That's our function in this society. That's why it makes people so mad when they meet a rich Indian <laughs> or a happy one. You know, they're like, that's not, no, that doesn't, no, that, no. You know, it's like that scene from Something About Mary, like, no, six minute abs, you know? <laughs> it doesn't compute. People don't like it, you know? They don't like it. So I had to find, so that was my problem, is that the only narrative that I had was a tragic narrative. And tragedy, right, if you go back to Aristotle, and we all remember our Aristotle, I'm sure, right? Tragedy is a drama posed in such a way as to elicit the feelings of pity and fear, which result in catharsis and unburdening, an intense feeling and then a release. That's what tragedy does, classically speaking, right? I have a problem with that. You know, the problem is that, of course, people will read about Native people and feel something very strongly in these tragic stories. You know, they'll feel the pity and the fear and they'll feel intense emotion and then they'll, they'll find a release of that emotion and they'll feel like that intense feeling they had is the same thing as political action or change and those feelings are not the same thing as change. Those are just feelings, that's it. And it's better than other feelings you can have vis-a-vis -vis Native people, but they're not productive. They do not change the status quo at all, you know. And they're not even accurate, right? Tragedy is not the right mode. Because I knew, because I'm from a reservation, I knew that the place I was from was much bigger, much more complicated, much more interesting than anyone had given it credit for, but I had no way to narrate that. And then something happened even worse and even closer to home. And what happened was my grandfather committed suicide at age 83 by shooting himself in the head. Don't know why. You know, I was in Minneapolis when I got the news and I drove up to the little village of Bina on the Leech Lake Reservation that my family's from. Anyone ever been to Bina? Micah, Leslie, see? That's my brother and my sister-in-law, by the way. <laughs> you know? And went to my grandmother's trailer and she had, my grandfather had killed himself in his house and my grandmother had moved out of his house a few years before that. Um, they got in an argument about the curtains no, for real. Yeah, this is the house that, okay, they called it the big house, which is kind of ironic, right? Because, you know, the big house is euphemism for jail, right? Anyway, they call, but it's not even a big house, but it's a small house, but they ever call it the big house. And my grandmother got in an argument with my grandfather because she wanted to change the curtains, and my grandfather said, well, no, because Ma Seely, his mother, put the curtains up. And he's like, well, no, Ma put those up. You know, and my grandma's like, yeah, 65 years ago. <laughs> and he said, well, yeah, but she put them up, so, you know, that's the way they are. Only she can take them down. And she's like, she's dead, Gene. 
He goes, guess they're staying up. She's like, that's it. And she moves out. But where I'm from, I don't know what it's like where you're from, but where I'm from, if you're mad at somebody, you've got to be mad close. You don't want to be mad far away. What's the point of being mad far away? What's the point of being mad at all if they can't see you being pissed off every day? So my grandmother put a trailer about 150 yards from my grandfather's house <laughs> so she could be mad at him every day and he could see that. <laughs> Sensible. You know, you don't have to get mad if you stay mad. This is productive. This is healthy. Right? It's not either of those things. But so I went to my grandmother's trailer. Um, she's the one that found him in his house, in the big house. And she was pretty messed up. My mother was there. She was pretty messed up. Aunts and uncles, cousins, everyone's there. And uh, my grandmother asked me to do two things. She said, would you please write a eulogy to read at his service? And I said, of course. I can do that. No problem. I'm a writer. I can manage it. And she goes, yeah, and I want you to go up to the big house and clean up what he did. That's the second thing. She goes, yeah, I don't, want any, I don't want anyone to know what happened. Just, just take it all away. Anything, just take it. Like, if it needs, got blood on it, just burn it. I don't, want any, I don't want to see, I don't want anyone to see that. And she goes, yeah, you know, your uncles can't do that. They can't see that. And I'm thinking to myself, like, why does she think that I can see that? <laughs> you know? And the reason, of course, why she thought I could see that was because she didn't think that I was close with him. You know, I was. But I'm not going to say no. I'm OK. Went up there, spent the day, the next day, down to the subfloor. I spent the day cleaning my grandfather's blood and brains off the floor of his room and off the stuff. Didn't burn it. I was too tired. I, I ditched it behind the garage. And then I went home, and I had to write a eulogy. Every part of me wanted, and I didn't know, I'd never written a eulogy before, ever. And now I've written a lot of them, actually. Um, I don't know what you're supposed to say. I don't know how, what, what you're supposed to do in a eulogy. What's their function, right? And I'm a functional approach kind of writer guy. I'm like, if I know the purpose of the thing, I can figure out the shape the thing should have. That's just how my brain works. But I'm like, okay, well, what's the function of the thing? Like, what's a eulogy need to do? Well, thinking, you know? Eulogy needs to say something true about the deceased. That's one thing a eulogy needs to do. Because there's nothing worse, there's nothing worse than going to the funeral of someone you loved and hearing them eulogized in terms that have no bearing on, on, on their lives. Like, Uncle Jimmy was the nicest man. And you're thinking, Uncle Jimmy was an asshole. <laughs> but we loved him. So you, you got to say something true, even if it's difficult. And you know, I don't know about your families, but there are no saints in mine, you know. So you have to say something true. That's important. And then you have to say something of some use to the living, because honestly, that's who the eulogy is for. It's not for the deceased. They're gone. They're off on their journey doing their thing. They don't need it. We need it. So it has to be of some use to us somehow. You know, Every part of me just wanted to grab on to my confusion and my disappointment and my, I was really mad at him. That's what I wanted. I wanted, and I was so tempted to tell a story of tragedy. My grandfather had a hard life as an Indian man growing up in the place he did. He suffered immeasurably throughout his life as a man, as a native person, as a soldier in the second division who landed at Normandy and fought in Belgium. He suffered. And I just wanted to grab onto that because I was suffering. I wanted, because I wanted that catharsis. I wanted that release, right? I wanted that pity and fear and that release. But I'm like, is that really true of his life, honestly? Was his life actually tragic, you know? I had to weigh it out. The bullet that traveled through his head was there for a fraction of a second, technically speaking. He lived for 83 years before that. 
what has more weight? What weighs more? What matters more? What's more significant? That fraction of a second or those 83 years? I started, started thinking about those 83 years. 83 years living in the only place in the world that mattered to him. And, and I cannot emphasize enough how the world lost focus the further away he got from that little village that no one has ever heard of. Bina, Minnesota. I mean, he barely cared about Cass Lake or Grand Rapids or Deer River or Bemidji, much less. He's like, who cares? Just dis disappear, he wouldn't even notice. But he got to live 80 of his 83 years in the only place in the world that mattered to him, and that does not sound like tragedy to me. I'm not that lucky. Are you that lucky? Uh-uh. I'm not. That's not tragic. That's good fortune. He got to spend 80 of his 83 years surrounded by the only people he loved, and he got to see them literally every single day of his life, except when he was shooting Germans and recovering from his wounds. That's it. Every day. His parents, his siblings, his cousins, his children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, every single day of his life. That's not, that's not tragic. That's good fortune. And so the more I thought about his life, I'm like, you know, his life wasn't a life of where there was less of everything. It was a life where there was more of everything, you know? And then I began thinking, like, okay, well, maybe that's the, maybe that's the story of reservations that I've been missing. That's the answer to, that's the opposite of tragedy. The opposite of the tragic tale of reservation life is not, I got how many minutes, five minutes? Okay, is not, you know, deficit. That's not the story. What about its opposite? And the opposite is not hope. Hope is not the opposite of tragedy. It's the same side of that cheap coin. It's not worth anything, you know. Not deficit, but surplus. There's more of everything. More pain, but more humor. More crime, but more loss. More poverty, but more hustle. More of everything. That was the narrative I was missing, right? So I like, gave my grandfather's eulogy, and then when that was done, I went back to writing, solved the riddle of that book, um, and was able to write a version which was not rejected by my publisher, and which was published, right? Where, like, reservations are like, they're so often understood or thought of, you know, and I haven't, I'm so sad, I don't have, you, I don't have time to get to a discussion of the heartbeat of Wundanee, which is like my more recent thing, but like, reservations are so often thought of as lands apart, you know, these little, basins of suffering tucked off in the middle of nowhere, you know, to the point where my brother, I think it was this brother, when he went to college, you know, people are like, well, where are you from? What are you? He's like, well, I'm native. I'm from Leech Lake Reservation. They're like, well, how'd you get out of there? <laughs> Is that, that was you, right, bro? Yeah. yeah. And they're like, the right, fence. And he's like, what do you mean? Like, well, there, isn't there a fence keeping you in? Literally. <laughs> like fenced in, you know? And he's like, I'm a good jumper. <laughs> You know, not true, <laughs> not true. I've seen him play basketball. Um, but they're so often seen as these lands apart. But you know, what I discovered in writing that book is that you, you, find a, find, you kind of find America concentrated, right? If you look at reservations, you see much more of America than you do of anything else. You know, so there are these extra potent, interesting, very strange places. Um, that I love dearly. So that was how I got started in nonfiction. And now we're going to wrap this part up, right, Catherine? And then we're going to go to a conversation. So thank you for indulging me. Thanks for laughing at my jokes. You know, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate you being uh, willing and opening up and sharing those very personal stories. Uh, you know, and I was sharing a little bit with uh, David before we... Um, met today and, and getting into his book, it is like this, and what I shared with is like an anthology of my life. You know, there's so <laughs> many different things that he hits on 
with his book, everything from you know relocation era policies to Haskell Indian Nations University, uh, the boarding school eras, you know, um, tying in the Kansas Act and, and tribal law and governance. I mean, they're just you know these huge impression impressionable moments in my life, and to see that articulated was really you know really comforting because. It is a story that needs to be told, and these are all stories that need to be told. The awareness of, of uh, you know, missing and murdered indigenous women, you know, it's something that's a phenomenon in Indian country. Mm. And to bring that voice to, you know, the black and brown communities, it's critically important, you know, that we advance the discussion so that way we can turn it into action. You know, we just don't want to talk about it. We want to be about it. We want to make sure that we're moving the needle um, with policy change, reform, you know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. re-legislation of the VAWA Act that happened yeah. recently. I mean, there's these huge movements that can take place in our lifetime that we can make these changes. And so that's what makes it more, um, you know, crucial now, you know, coming out of what we've been through the past two years to really, um, you know, uh, focus our energies and uh, to try and move that needle and make things better um, for the next generation. You know, you talked about your kids and, and those types of things moving forward. So, um, you know, we are talking about the topic of resiliency, you know, and I think in a lot of ways, um, you know, not to um, um, overlook, overlook all of what's connected, what's under resiliency. And I kind of mentioned this when we met earlier this week is that, you know, is just labeling it resiliency and trying to move on from that. Are we giving um, the... Uh, experience enough attention you know are we are we really giving enough words to um, you know not just the pain misery and despair but the happy joyous and free portion of it you know because there is a lot of both sides of that in in our communities and in our cultures and so kind of uh, briefly would ask that question you know as is, is is there a, an oversimplification by saying you know it, that's a resilient person and then trying to move on I mean, you go first. Okay. Yeah. Um, first of all, as much as I love language, um, anything that we put into language uh, automatically becomes slightly truncated, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because language is just one form of expression. But when I think of um, resilience, right, I think it's um, something that <coughs> Many communities and individuals experience. It's it's a story of our re reincarnation happening in our daily lives. But we do need to devote more time into it. So, like in this in this book, the first two sections of the book have a lot of joy in them, a lot of laughter. And in a recent reading, one woman, thank you, thanks so much. Yeah, I was looking for that, couldn't find it. Thank you. Um, one woman um, just held her head down at the end of the reading, and she said, why did you end the book so sadly? And I said, because I had to demonstrate what was at risk, not just individual lives, but the entire culture of black girlhood in America, which is kind of an isolated culture um, in ways because, you know, the way um, America is set up. That person that embodies youth, that embodies femininity, and that em embodies blackness may have less access to what people think is power. But that person and that community that that person lives in is also a generator of power and happiness. And if it weren't, then what are we selling in music? if not black girlhood culture? What are we selling in fashion, if not black girlhood culture? And these things emerge and become commodified once the power in them is recognized. But it's kind of self-generated. When you live in a society where people presume that you don't have power, your entire daily experience is a st strategic intellectual navigation, right? And so we, we tend to ignore how smart people have to be to move around in spaces where people think they shouldn't be. Right? And so it's not that the resilience 
you know, just as like a happenstance act. But it, it's kind of cultivated, as David was talking about, by the social condition, right? That the, uh, Lucille Clifton used to always say, life, what life demands balance. Mm. So um, I think it shows up in, in that way. Thank you. Thank you very much. David, would you like the opportunity to respond oh, as well? Um, no, I thought Demers did a great job. Uh, yeah. Crazy. That was great. Okay. I just rebound off what you said earlier. You know, you like, okay, yeah. okay. That was, You're that doing was better than I could say. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, a quick question we talk about, and um, this can be layered, but the importance of storytelling, you know, and the representation, you know, and, and part of the uh, conference theme is, you know, storytelling, right? Visibility and making sure that, you know, we're showing up and sharing those voices. How do we use that voice to, um, you know, help others heal, but also uh, keep the conversation relevant um, and, and making sure that it resonates with, with people. So in an educational institution, and we talked briefly offline about the power of HBCUs um, and uh, TCUs, tribal colleges, universities. And so I kind of would like to hear from you both about you know, the importance of uh, visibility in, in this um, era you know, that we're currently in mm -hmm. and the power of uh, those educational institutions like uh, HBCUs and TCUs. Mm -hmm. David, you're first. Okay, I can do that. I mean, You know, I think it's Michelle Alexander who brings up in the new Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. She talks about the situation, and Claudia Rankin also amplifies this in Citizen, you know, this idea for African-American folk of sort of hyper-visibility as a sort of category, and hyper-invisibility -in as individual human beings, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's undoubtedly true, and there's, they so eloquently brought up both those two issues. Um, it's, it's also true for Native people, but maybe even more so, right? Um, I think it, it's, it's our function, as I mentioned earlier, to just not even be here, you know? <laughs> to not even exist. And people get so confused by living, breathing, and you know, fully functional and active Native folk going about living their lives to the point where it's, it's jarring for people. We're not supposed to be here. Our history is supposed to have ended in 1890 with the closure of the frontier and the massacre at Wounded Knee, and that's sort of the end. And there's this tendency, though, right? There's this tendency around sort of to the extent that people can sort of kind of accept that we still, we still exist, not just as individuals or as descendants of, but as sovereign nations, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, um, so I feel this, this question of invisibility, you know, very, very keenly, you know? And there's this tendency to tune in when people can't admit that we do exist. Look, people read Native books as kind of a liberal social act. Let's be honest, you know? They're like, you know what? It's so bad what happened to the Native folk. It's just so, I feel, mm, my heart hurts for them. At least I could do is read Troyer's book and read Troyer's book, and then they feel better about themselves, you know? But there's better reasons to, there's better reasons to read and better reasons to imagine, you know? And I could go on a rant if you want, you know? You want me to go on a rant? I'll go on a rant. You want the rant? Okay. Go. It's, it'll, I'll try to be quick. No, pew. Okay. Go. America's first revolutionary act was the Boston Tea Party where they dumped tea in Boston Harbor and dressed as native folk, dressed as Mohawk native people to not only protest and to suggest symbolically that the British were treating the American colonists the way that everyone was treating the native folk, but because one of the main reasons, and you're not taught this, that the colonists went to war with the crown was over the question of who got to colonize the lands to the west of the 13 colonies. Who got to profit off of stealing from us, the British or the colonists? That was one of the main reasons they went to war. Mm -hmm. After that revolution and after, you know, the founding fathers are getting together like, hey, what are we going to do? What kind of government are we going to have? To whom did they turn for inspiration? 
to the Mohawks again. And it's on the Iroquois Confederacy that our balance of power was modeled in part. The executive, the judicial, the legislative. American government is native government, you know? Moving ahead, we're taught that the first real test of states' rights versus federal power was over the question of slavery resulting in the Civil War. Not true. The first case of states' rights versus federal power was over the question of the removal of the five civilized tribes from, and all tribes actually, east of the Mississippi to points west with the passage of the Indian Relocation Act of 1830. That was the first test of that. Power in this country has always been three ways. states feds, and tribes, always, mm -hmm. you know? Moving ahead, the United States Supreme Court heard more cases about federal Indian law between 1965 and 1995 than any other genre of law. More than civil rights, more than women's rights, more than reproductive rights, more than banking, more than immigration, by a margin, a large margin. So as America was trying to refigure what kind of country we were after enduring civil rights and Watergate and the Vietnam War and the Pentagon Papers and all of that mess, at least in the courts, at the Supreme Court level, they were doing so by thinking about the collective rights of tribes. This country has not just been obsessed by us, it has been shaped by us, you know? You can't understand this country. You can't take its temperature. You can't see where it's been. You can't tell where it's going unless you know Native history. That's a better reason. That's a much better reason than tuning in to Tommy Orange's new novel or Louise Erdrich's new novel or my new book as a way to sort of soothe one's own guilty conscience, like volunteering at an after-school program teaching little kids how to read. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a good thing to do. Don't get me wrong. That's vital. But come on, it's better reasons to engage, to imagine, right? So that's the importance of storytelling, right? The, the first part of your question. So the rant is over. It's over. I'm done. No, I'm I done. love that rant. Deep breath. I'm good now. Thank you. I, I love you. that rant. Okay. I love that rant, and I love that um, that perspective. I often, you know, I, I once had an interview with someone that didn't want me at their university, <laughs> um, and they they once asked me. Um, how would I integrate? Um, so I'll just say, this was at a military college. Um, so they were like, how would I teach American studies at a, Mar at a military college um, and cultural studies? I said, I would remind them that Crispus Attucks was the first person to die for this That's nation. That's right. You cannot teach America without talking about black and brown people. Go to Europe and ask for some popcorn and wait for it. Right? Ask for some southern cooking and wait for it. Ask for peanuts, okra, wait for it. Ask for sugar, wait for it. All of the things that we enjoy in our cuisine and the way we live is most likely exploited from brown and black, and black people. And it is, in fact, those lessons that allow this quote-unquote nation state to reinvent itself and survive outside of its English or British inheritance. We are the bastards of the Brits, if you embrace that, right? And so there's a bunch of, American can be the story of a bunch of bastard sons fighting for their inheritance, right? But the way that they survived is exploiting some of the lessons from brown and black people because clearly the English system was not working for them. That is a history that we should embrace, right? When we talk about resilience. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Powerful. And so we are, uh, they're trying to keep me on schedule up here too. Sorry for walking in front of you all. But um, we do want to make sure we have a question or two. And, and we'll have a mic on that side. And I have one over here. And so we got some hands. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Richard Gonzalez, and I'm also going to be one of the speakers for tomorrow in uh, diversity and book publishing. So this really addresses some of the things I've, I'm going to talk about tomorrow as well. Uh, you're from both sides of state. I, I get it. Uh, I think that's what I heard. <laughs> that's true. Uh, let me bring you to Texas. 
we have a lieutenant governor, Dan uh, Patrick, who recently uh, said that we need to remove any tenure for any university professors, oh, no, uh, and also to ban critical race theory to be taught on the college level. And currently, there are a bunch of books on the high school and elementary school level that school libraries have been forced to uh, send in for review. There's a list of basically uh, critical race theory, as they claimed, critical race theory type books. Now, how do you react to that? We've, we've talked about theory, we talked about um, you know, your own philosophies, but let's talk practical terms here, mm. down to earth. What do we do with the political powers at play right now who are trying to restrict books and writers and teachers from speaking the truth? Hmm. Mm. Good question. Yeah, very good Thank question. you. Well, you know, I don't want to say bad things about Texas. <laughs> but it's sounding a lot more like Gilead every day, <laughs> you know? And uh, I mean, this kind of thing happens, it's been happening a lot. I mean, it's not the first time this has happened. Right. You know, it's ha it, they've tried things like this in New Mexico where they banned or tried to dismantle ethnic studies programs and it kind of became like a, you know, it was a, it was a conservative ploy to get liberals to hang themselves on a hook of their own fashioning, right? Gamesmanship in a way. But this has happened not only, you know, it's not just in Texas, it's happened in New Mexico, it's happened in Tennessee and Kentucky, it's happened all over the place, you know, going way back. And you know, you know, you just have to, I mean, what, what we practically do, I don't know, except you just overwhelm and you evade, right? That's what you do, you know, and you vote, right? And you resist the ways in which sort of, you know, the districts are sort of rigged up to sort of secure only one outcome, you know? Um, I don't have a practical answer for you, except that you, you got to keep writing those books, you got to keep telling those stories, and you got to keep reminding people that, I don't know, you know, our, um, our, our Declaration of Independence is um, itself a racial document. Absolutely. You know? And you can't understand it unless you got some critical race theory under your belt. You're not even going to understand that, you know? And so, like, um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you've got a really, really active and difficult child. You know, you can't respond to everything they say. You know. Mm -hmm. And it's like, <laughs> Lieutenant Governor is that child. For sure, for sure. Not Texas. You know, the governor, <laughs> Lieutenant Governor. And he's got to be, you know, like, that's, that's sweet, dear. Okay, no, okay, okay. And just keep moving, you know. I don't know. I'm not, a, I'm not a politician, so I don't know how to make things happen. I'm just a guy who shows up places and causes trouble. <laughs> That's my job. Yeah, I'm not a politician either, but something that I've been encouraging people to do is have those conversations at your quote-unquote Thanksgiving and your Christmas dinner table. Because the people that are voting against your interests are sometimes in your family. So we can yell at politicians and scream at politicians and people that we know and love can continue to vote in secret for the same people. Mm -hmm. If you have a problem with these people, if you have a problem with these policies, have difficult conversations across your dinner table, across your meeting tables, in the way that you spend your money, in the way that you invite people to your home, have those conversations then. And maybe those conversations will follow people into their votes. You know, like, that's really good, right? <laughs> um, I'm kind of an instigator, you know? And like, I, there, there are things that, okay, my, my, my personal sort of addiction is Brazilian jiu-jitsu, mm -hmm. right? I'm, I love it. That's what I do. That's what I do. I love it. Understandably, you know, when a bunch of men get together to roll around on the floor with each other in a sweaty mess for a couple hours, there's a lot of sort of resultant homophobia that they feel like they got to express because they don't want people to take 
get the wrong message, right? So there's a lot of like bro-y homophobia where I train. I do not like that, you know? My daughter's gay, you know? And so it really pisses me off. So I just wear the gayest rash guards I possibly can. <laughs> <laughs> I roll up in there like that, and I'm just daring somebody to say something. And then I can just put the crank on them, you know? <laughs> And that's like, you know, and so that the place is becoming gradually a little more inclusive, you know, like they're chilling out a little bit. Some guy's like, nice shirt. I'm like, do you want to say something about my shirt? <laughs> okay, say something and we're going to roll, you know, and it's going to hurt. <laughs> so I don't know. That's not applicable. You can't use that in some other context. It's pretty specific, but you just gotta keep, you gotta keep, you gotta keep at it. You so, gotta keep at it. But they, they banned Beloved yeah. exactly. for a long time, you know. They banned Ulysses, they banned Lolita, they banned Mouse more recently in Kentucky. Yeah. Yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that you can ban it as much as you want, but the, the book is not going anywhere, you know. And it's still finding its way into the hands of kids who would find the parable of these mice really instructive to think about the Holocaust, you know? And, and, and that's investment. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you both. Yeah. I, can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you. I, I have one in back. Too, oh, okay. so. since, since you mentioned working at Pantheon, right, and being an editor, how are you going to change, or do you plan to change uh, the market, the publishing, uh, or what yeah. are you looking for? What do you plan to bring to yeah. that? Um, I guess. That's yeah, so I decided to become busier. I don't know any other way. But a couple years ago, it was actually two summers ago, I, I was asked to review a book by someone who claimed to be a native writer. It was a YA novel. It was set on an Ojibwe reservation that exists in Minnesota called Fond du Lac place I know, and it was freaking horrifying. I thought it was a terrible book. And um, I thought to myself, like, if there'd just been an editor who knew a thing or two, they could've, it could've been a good book. It could've been a beautiful book. I'm like, all right, let me look around. And I was talking about this earlier. I looked around and did a survey of the publishing industry. There was not a single Native American editor at any houses that I knew of at all. Like, I couldn't find anyone working in publishing. Now, at, at a commercial or trade imprint, right? There are definitely native editors who work at university presses and other smaller presses and things like that. But I'm like, well, that seems like an African-American folks are underrepresented in the editorial ranks, you know? Latinx people are underrepresented in the editing ranks. I mean, there's underrepresentation for a lot of different, different kinds of people. Um, but there was no native people. And I'm like, well, okay, I should probably be that person then. I should do that. So now I'm doing that. Um, and so I'm in a unique position um, to find, to, to know who's writing and who's producing new stuff, to find the stuff, to help, to nurture it, to grow it, to get it into the hands of readers, you know, um, and to sort of create narrative scarcity is what my colleague called it, right? To help address, finally got it an hour later, um, <laughs> such as my brain. What he called was narrative scarcity to help address this issue of narrative scarcity, you know, publish different kinds of voices, you know. And in Native American literature, that's already happening in ways that it's really exciting, you know. 25 years ago, there were two Native writers anyone talked about, and there were like four or five others that no one talked about. Um, I can't even, I couldn't even list the people writing today who are doing interesting things. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. You know, and I'm now can like, there's horror, there's genre stuff, there's YA fantasy stuff, there's, you know, literary fiction, there's very strange literary fiction. <laughs> there's, there's so much stuff coming out now. It's a great time to be a writer if you're native, and it's a great time to be a reader, especially if you like reading those stories. And a student. You know, and a student. Um, but sort of in my small way at Pantheon Books, like I get to acquire and, and publish voices that might not otherwise get out there or that might get mismanaged yeah. and not do well, you know? So, and I just bought my first two books from somebody. I'm very excited, I know. Yeah. And um, 
It's uh, an honor, actually, to, to, to be able to do that, that work. So I'll try to squeeze in one more question, if that's okay, and send it to the back. Oh, my goodness, I'm the last question. Okay. <laughs> Let me stand out the way here. I uh, just want to uh, preface this. by um, Here's my question, but I have to preface it after I ask you. What is the best outcome? Okay. David, you talked about lazy storytelling. There's no such thing. Lazy is like. Storytelling is different. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to talk from my black side, although I have a Native American side, but they're not pulling that over at 3 a.m. in the morning. They're pulling the black side over. Um, my black is exhausted. Mm -hmm. And if black people could, Native Americans and black people could fix the issue of resilience and race in America, we would have done it in 1620. <laughs> All right. And so my question to you is that we're living in an America that had no exit strategy. There was no exit strategy for slavery. There was no exit strategy for Native Americans being put off to that so-called place called a reservation, which I think is a false use of a word. So my question to you is not to come, and I love your book about the missing black girls because there were five of them in my family. Mm -hmm. And I love your story about the reservation being a place of growth and rewards instead of the negative nature that it gives. But what I find the problem is, is that we're not focusing our change in America on the people who need the change. Mm -hmm. When I did diversity training 20 years ago, it was to make white people feel less guilty or else I wouldn't get paid, <laughs> all right? So I had to follow the money. Now it's called DE&I, and it's still getting to the point where you won't get rewards if you don't make us feel better. So in the outcome, and this was for you, David, because you said you worked at the publishing house, it's not about putting the books that come through to tell the true stories. What about the ones that are, should be stopped because they are, it is an effort of anti-racism? I'm not going to publish this book. It will never make America because it's not built on a lie. You know, our whole history in America, where we're living, the Americans in this country of European descent had no exit strategy. You were supposed to stay enslaved. You were supposed to be shunted away to a reservation because we were done with you. And we've had laws since 1619 all the way to just recently on meritorious manumission that tells us we cannot be who we are. Now the le most recent laws is voting and CRT. I'm a native Texan. My family's been here since 1893, so I'm not making it up. So how do we stop the outcomes of the things that keeps telling the lazy lies and not the good storytelling? How do you stop that? As a publisher, you can stop that. As a writer, you can change that. How do we create the outcomes? And what is the outcome you want your writing to be? Hmm. That's a really good question. Because shoot me. Mm -hmm. it's a good question. Can I tell you another story? I won't go off, though. <laughs> Do we have time for that? So like, my father died in uh, 2016. 89, just a couple weeks shy of his 90th birthday. A few weeks, January. And uh, he'd been suffering for a long time from dementia. Dementia is a pretty cruel way to go, especially for someone like him who really lived by his wits, you know? He was, a, he was a, an incredible storyteller and a, a guy who would never shut up. He talked all the time, you know? And it annoyed me as a child, but when he was dying and I got fewer and fewer stories, you know, it just kind of eroded and erased from his mind until he just had a couple left. And we'd heard those so many times, you know? It was exhausting. I was living with him for a spell, taking care of him for a spell. And we're sitting there having lunch. And uh, it was the run up to Trump was getting ready to, he was already running, you know? And I'm like, my father was so out of it, he didn't really register that that was happening. And I was pretty grateful for that because it, it would have pissed him off, <laughs> you know? And I was like, Dad, like, we actually, the first thing that happened is we were, we were eating lunch, and I'm like, how was the food in the army? Because my father was an immigrant. He was a refugee to this country. He fled here, you know? And then he was here for a few short years before he joined the army, and the army, in its brilliance, took this fluent German and English speaker and sent him to the Pacific, <laughs> taught him Japanese and sent him to the Pacific to fight in the Pacific, right? That's what you do with someone who's fluent in German. This country, right? 
And, um, but I asked him, I'm like, how was the food in the army? He's like, it was great. First time I got three meals a day in my life, as much as I wanted. It was great, super, I had no complaints. And then he told me a story about how on the base in Okinawa um, that he was on, the civilian population was starving to death. And so he convinced a bunch of guys that worked in the kitchen to drag the food that they would, the GIs would just dump in these big barrels out off the base so these people could eat. And he goes, it was crazy. Like there was a big throng of people and he goes, and I clapped my hands and they all stood in a line and they had like shell casings and hats and bags. They had anything they could carry, any kind of food and they would, they would get it out of these huge drums of waste, right? The base commander said, you know what? That's not cool. We shouldn't do that. So you guys can't do that anymore and you gotta dump bleach on the food, mm -hmm. you know? When my dad had emigrated to the States, he landed in Yellow Springs, Ohio, which was an integrated town. It was an integrated high school in the 40s, mm -hmm. you know? The only place they could, they could afford to live was in the black part of town across from the AME church. All of his friends were, Af the only friends he had, as this re weird refugee kid from Austria, were African-American people at his school and in his neighborhood. And those are the exact same people who are working in the kitchen because that's the only job the army would give African-American soldiers, or one of the few. But he knew, the, but he had a connection with these guys. He's like, why don't we disobey orders? Why don't we just not do that? And so these, my father and these other people, at the, the lowest, most vulnerable members of the service and of American society, together, defied direct orders and snuck food off the base, did not put bleach on it for these people who were starving. And I asked my father, I'm like, didn't that feel weird? He's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, considering what, the, what Japan had done in China, in Manchuria, you know, the Philippines. I'm like, didn't it feel weird to then? And he looked at me like I was like the, the worst and the dumbest son that he, and he had six sons, <laughs> so, you know? And he's like, they were human beings, David. That's it, they were human beings and they were starving. That's all I needed to know. What do you need to know? You know, th this new story that I'd never heard came at the very end of his life. And I sat there with that and I thought about that. I'm like, how do you deal with it? And again, he's like, deal with what? I'm like, the stupid stuff this country does over and over and over again. And he's like, I'm like, I don't have a choice. I was born here and this, my tribe is here. I'm not gonna give up, my, give up my country, I give up my tribe too, you know? But you chose this place, so how do you deal with it? And he's like, it's really simple. He goes, no one else wanted me and everyone else tried to kill me. Like Austria tried to kill me and Germany tried to kill me. France wouldn't take me, Belgium wouldn't take me, England wouldn't take me, but this country did. It saved my life. And so how do I deal with it? It's my job to save it every day. Just that's the job, that's the deal. It saves me, I save it. So like that's what I would say, like, you know, when I, I think about my father quite a bit and I think about those two final stories I really got from him before there were no more stories, you know? Like, yeah, you know, you're right about everything you said, and yet, you know, it's our job, always, to keep this country from doing the things it would otherwise want to do, to make it better, always, you know? I just want to add to that, like, two cents. It is, it is your duty and your responsibility to claim joy to claim desire, like to know what you want. Because understanding what you want is the first step towards power in any situation. So claiming joy, knowing your desires, and seeking beauty, it's like your duty and responsibility to do that. Because that's a part of your human entitlement that exists outside of those parameters that appear to have all of power, right? But then after you do that, it's your job to teach others to do that. Yeah. And that's how we begin to live outside of that, yeah. in my opinion.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. We are um, uh, fresh out of time. I think we might be a little bit over, but I appreciate all of the feedback. Thank you for the questions. Um, you know, what's kicking this off. Thank you, uh, Thomas uh, uh, De Piero, Dean of Students. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'll turn it over for Catherine to close us. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stick my foot in my mouth. But thank you all. It's been a pleasure uh, being the moderator tonight. Thank you so much to you guys for coming. That was really lovely. Um, sorry if I was rushing you. <laughs> um, I, made, I took some notes this time. But just starting off, I know we've got a couple of our authors and moderators in the audience for other panels. So if you are here and you're you know, going to participate in one of the other events, we just ask you to stand up so we can all just appreciate you and thank you guys for being here and supporting the other events. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. It's really great to have you guys out here, um, and I hope you guys will, you know, join us for the other events as well. Um, we also just wanted to take a quick second to thank all of our donors uh, generally, but we've got, you know, the Student Senate uh, especially has, you know, helped us a lot, uh, but the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at SMU, Lauren Embry, Dedman College uh, at SMU, uh, Jean and Jerry Jones, Sarah and Tom Dunning, and also the Tate Lecture Series. Um, and we've got you know, many other donors as well, but we really appreciate like, people helping us to make this happen. And along with that, that goes also for the people who are helping us, the companies, but also you know, the students and the professors. Uh, you, know, you guys have been really instrumental in making this happen. So we really appreciate all of your time and work on this. Um, and then I just wanted to do a quick reminder about Oh, I'm standing in front of it, bidding on this lovely painting. Um, there is a website for that, which is linked on the Dallas Literary Festival website. Ra, is it anywhere else we can find it? Yes, it's ra.betterworld.org. Ra.betterworld.org. R-A, yes, Susan? She's amazing. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so we'd really encourage you to do that. It's a lovely painting, as you can see. Um, and so I also wanted to just cover just a couple of the events for tomorrow. Um, we've got Eric Dickerson uh, coming as our keynote, talking about his most recent book, or his, his debut book, Watch My Smoke. Uh, and that'll be at 12 in conversation with Donovan Lewis of the Ticket Radio Station. We've also got um, The Sentences That Create Us, which is a discussion with Kate Messner, um, And that is going to be at uh, 3.15 to 4.30. Uh, we've got Poets Do Dallas with Darius Frazier and Dustin Pearson, 145 to 3. Um, and we've got a, a lovely panel with Brittany K. Barnett, uh, which is Meditations and Memoirs on Justice from 4.45 to 6. And all of those are in this building, and they're all free, like this event. So we definitely encourage you to come out. Um, and I think that is pretty much everything. But um, if you haven't registered for this event, we would just ask that you do that uh, through the website or you know, however. It's just your name and email, just so we know who attended. Um, but then also, there's a book signing downstairs right after I stop talking. Um, and I would very much encourage you guys to go to that as well. So thank you guys all for coming out. I think that concludes this opening program. Uh, thank you. <laughs>